welcome to the IGDA Chicago presentation for learning more about game jams, specifically global game jam. Thank you all for joining me here today, and I hope that you are ready to learn everything you want to know about game jams in particular. And my presentation uh, could be about if you are a community manager and you want to know how to organize your own game jam, I can help you with that. If you are a student and you would like to attend a game jam, come on in, come on in, we're just starting. If you'd like to attend a game jam and you just want to know more about how to maximize your experience and how to do that, I can also answer those questions too. So why don't I get a read of the room and ask how many of you think that you fall in the category of being an attendee participating in a game jam? Does anyone raise their hand for they want to learn how to organize and run a game jam? Oh, multiples. Okay. To the person in the corner, I just, I might not hear your question. Yeah. So if you ask a question, you might It's fine. I talk loud. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, my name is Sarah Sexton. I have lived in Chicago for about three years, maybe going on four years. Uh, come on in, we're just getting started. If you're here for Global Game Jam information, welcome. And I graduated from Central Washington University up in the Pacific Northwest with a major in computer science and a minor in communications. And I graduated about three years ago and I got a job at Microsoft right after I graduated. I've been working here in Chicago for Microsoft ever since. And my true passion is for video games and I love I love helping people be successful by using technology. The, the work I do for Microsoft involves me being an advocate for helping people uh, use Microsoft technologies. And that includes a language called C Sharp, which is very popularly used in the Unity 3D game engine. So a lot of individuals who want to learn more about Unity for making video games or maybe if they have questions about publishing them to Windows or the Windows Store or the Xbox game console can come to me and I can help answer their questions. But I have a lot of technical focus areas generally all across the board, but um, video games is really where my heart lies. Uh, I also am a community organizer of the Voxels, Chicago's Women in Game Development, and I have some more information about that. I've organized several game jams through the Voxels and partnering up with groups like IGDA Chicago, uh, that stands for International Game Developers Association, and the Sugar Gamers, which is another group in Chicago. It's like a very similar group to the Voxels, but instead of focusing on developing the video games, they focus on uh, playing and being consumers of video games and geek culture. So if you want to learn more, uh, just remember the Sugar Gamers and the Voxels, and uh, I can, write down any of this information if any of you have any questions about it. So this is going to be very informal. Uh, I'm basically going to sit over here and uh, show you some websites and answer some questions. So please feel free to raise your hands. And um, for the purposes of the camera recording, maybe we can have somebody who repeats the questions or like we can have you stand up and speak your question very loudly and I will do my best to answer it. And if we run out of questions before nine o'clock, then we don't have to stay the whole time. So let's begin. So over here, we have Global Game Jam. Global Game Jam is very cool. And I participated in it in Atlanta, Georgia, because it is global. It happens all over the world. You can participate from almost anywhere. And it was a very exciting time. Uh, it is the world's largest game jam event. Uh, so let me actually take a step back for anybody who is here to find out who has the question of what is a game jam? Okay, All right, got one. Anybody else, what is a game jam? <clears throat> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so a game jam is like a sleepover or a slumber party. Uh, you have something around 24 hours, maybe 36 hours, maybe 48 hours, but generally no longer than 48 hours to create from scratch a video game. There are also game jams where you create board games, paper games, card games, like other physical analog games that aren't digital, 
But for the most part, you create digital video games over the course of one or two days with a team or maybe by yourself. So does that, does that make sense? It's kind of like a race to the finish for creating a video game from scratch. Okay, so that's a game jam. They're extremely fun. They're great ways to get involved in what it's like to become a video game developer. And going to a game jam can be a collaborative effort where everyone has a good time and everyone sort of works to make something that they're passionate about. Or it could be a competitive game jam where there is a winner and there are prizes. Uh, the structure of the game jams that usually everybody gathers in one spot. Uh, sometimes somebody will maybe play a video about what the theme of the game jam is, or there'll be a short keynote presentation uh, welcoming everybody to the jam on the first day. And uh, having a theme for a game jam, it, it's, a, it's a little bit self-explanatory, but it's, it's sort of like a criteria for what you want the game to be. And it, it actually helps a lot for cutting down on this phenomenon of analysis paralysis where if you, if you just could make a video game about anything in the entire world, you might spend several hours just trying to narrow down what to build. But if somebody gives you a theme right out of the gate and they say the theme is cyberpunk, then you know, like, okay, I need to think of an example of what is cyberpunk and how do I get the judges to agree with me that my game fits with the theme. And it could be a game mechanic, it could be a way you play the game, it could be the way the game looks, or it could be any other aspect of the game. And usually if there's a theme, then there will generally be judges who judge your game at the end of the game jam. Do I have any questions about that so far? Feel free to speak up. Yes, Andrew. Uh, when it comes to uh, preparing and forming teams, what are some things to keep in mind uh, when you're, you're gathering your crew? That is an excellent question. Particularly in regards to like team dynamic and uh, size. Team dynamic and <coughs> size. So team dynamic and size, that's a really good question. Um, and I'm going to try to explain it in terms that people can relate to. Uh, raise your hand if you are, you consider yourself familiar with the creative arts, such as film, animation, or um, creating movies, creating, okay? Uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with software development, technology, writing code, programming, okay? Okay, what else? Um, okay, I think that, that should be, hmm? Storytelling? Well, what, so the, the analogy that I'm trying to paint here is uh, if you're making a movie, you have directors, producers, writers, actors, uh, people who work uh, in, in post, who edit the movie, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm saying is like, you can't just captain the ship by yourself. You need a crew. You need people with diverse skill sets. So the answer to Andrew's question about like, can I explain about team dynamic at size is like um, it would be great if you could have one of every skill set represented on your team. Easier said than done, but if you can have an artist to create cool assets for your game, then your game will look nice. If you have a sound designer to create sound effects and music for your game, then your game will sound nice. If you have a good designer who can come up with good level design, map layouts, and game mechanics that are fun, then your game will feel nice. And you don't have to worry about it smelling nice, not yet. <laughs> so we got sounds nice, feels nice, looks nice, smells nice, and tastes nice. You don't have to worry about it tasting nice unless you're making like a, an edible fruit basket game jam. <laughs> Uh, so, and then there's this, there's like this intuitive sixth sense of having it just all come together in a flow, and that's a little bit more nuanced to get into. So there's obviously more to it than just three things. And I, I like the analogy of, um, 
uh, an entire orchestra coming together and you, you have all the different sections of music that create a nice full bodied sound, you also have a conductor. Um, the conductor leads the team, makes sure everybody stays on time, stays on task, doesn't, doesn't let the whole project go on a tangent and waste too much time and keeps people's morale up. So that sort of thing could be someone who is a producer or a director or um, like a, a lead designer. Uh, like the, the, the conductor of the orchestra kind of keeps everybody on task. You can have the, the tech person who is in charge of programming. They can, they know how to write scripts. They know how to write in programming languages. They can make three dimensional objects move on the screen or they can make two dimensional objects move on the screen. Uh, they know how to use a game engine, which is a tool in which you build your game. Uh, an engine is kind of, an engine is basically like a, a toolbox or a sandbox. It's, it's, whatever tool you use to create the game. And I remind me to come back to game engines because there's a lot more detail I could go into there, but I'm still trying to stay on topic of team, which is, it, it deserves a long answer, so I'm giving it a lot of time. And um, why don't you, why don't you uh, let me know what I've given you so far? Like what, what notes have you absorbed so far? Uh, one hour so skill set should comprise your team, so, uh... Fulfilling every aspect, so you got your sound design, art, programmer, and game design. If there are multiple roles, you don't have a, have a lead, uh, and, uh, or a producer to help delegate those tasks and keep you on point so that you're uh, meeting the customers. Yes, that is very good. Um, something that can happen all too often is what I call feature creep or uh, something becoming out of scope. Scope is what you want to focus on. What's, what's an example? Uh, so an example of if, if you're building a phone app, I was just having a conversation with my coworker the other day about a phone app he built for his campus university. Um, a, 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 an app that's a popular idea of, I want to use GPS to make sure I, I can walk home safe at night. So I got my phone, uh, I can use a map, and then I have a, a buddy that I can send an automated text message to by setting an alert through the app, I say, I am here. If I am not at my destination in 20 minutes, please send an automated text message to the buddy that I have assigned and tell them, hey, so-and-so didn't reach their destination in the time that they thought they'd make it. Can you please reach out to them? And if they don't pick up or if they don't respond, can you please call campus police? They think that they might be in Public trouble. Public safety. Public safety. Yes, so it was, uh, it was a very good idea for an app. And that was all it was supposed to be. So when they built it and they showed it to like the campus, um, the, the student body and the campus uh, authorities who run like the public safety segment of the school and um, like the, the programs that have the posters up in your school hallways and stuff, they said, this is amazing. This is so great. Can you add our website that has a list of safety concerns? Can you have another page in your app that's like, um, maybe a suicide hotline, a drug abuse hotline, a, an alcohol abuse hotline. Can you have like a, like a poison ingestion hotline? Can you like have the general safety measures? Can you just have that in a new page on a bulleted list? Because if somebody's using this app and they're fearing for their safety, maybe we can have like some, some other numbers they can call. And the developers, they have like, oh, okay, sure, why not? And then so they did it and they brought it back to the campus police and the campus police said, this is amazing. This is incredible. We love this. Uh, can you give us a dashboard so we can sit in the, in the police station and we have a map where we see everybody's dots moving around the screen like the Marauders map in Harry Potter or like if you're sharing your location with someone over GPS, you see all these dots walking around campus. Uh, so, the, so the police can answer the phone when someone calls campus police and say, hey, I was using the Walk Me Home app and my buddy didn't respond and they said I'm supposed to call you, so hi. And the police can be like, all right, what friend are you um, supervising and like they can give you a name and they look at the map and they see the names next to everybody's dots and that's a great idea and they implemented it and the police were like yay thank you so much 
and they thought that they were done, and then they showed it to the rest of the school, and the rest of the school's like, oh, this is so great. Can you add our campus uh, instruction manual for new students and just have a map of the campus with labels of every building? And can you geocache it because the police don't have jurisdiction outside of the campus map? And if the, if the person's dot walks off the campus map, can you alert the rest, like the rest of the city police because the campus police can't handle it? Feature after feature after feature after feature, like, hey, can you add this? Hey, can you add that? Hey, can you add this? And if you keep letting that happen, even if they sound like great, awesome, helpful ideas, you have gone outside of your scope. Your scope got bigger and bigger and bigger and features creeped and crept and crawled into your thing and now it's somebody else's thing. It's not really your thing anymore. So everybody might have the best of intentions, but when you only have two days, you really have to watch out for feature creep, keeping your scope small. Start small, do one idea, do one idea well. Don't try to do all the ideas. Don't make one app to rule them all. It never works. It goes into feature creep, tar pit, quicksand trap. Does anybody have any questions about that? Ross. Uh, absent a particular kind of theme for a game jam, are there certain kinds of games that you never want to try to attempt to do in a game jam, like given time constraints or engine constraints? Is there do you have a story about ah. something you should just never try to do? I do! Thank you so much for asking. Your game idea is too big dot com. <laughs> <laughs> so, who wants to build a massively multiplayer online MMO for their first game game jam? Alright, well I hope you have $12,000 lying around to pay professional developers to do this for you. I feel like that's lowballing it by a lot. Yeah, yeah. This is indie MMO. So you could hire a team to make it for twelve thousand dollars, or you can make it for yourself in three months. MMO without content. It would probably just be squares, but all the squares would be in one room. No, it's a square list. Okay. Um, all right. Remind me to talk about gray boxing. Yes. Yay. Can't hit the send button until that thing goes away. So I'm gonna tweet. Remind me about gray boxing. Okay, so Ross, you said what kind of game should you not make in a two-day time-constrained game jam? Uh, let me see if I can zoom in on this. Yep. Yes. Okay. For those playing the home game, uh, use your common sense. You'll, you'll, you'll figure it out, like, you might have to learn it the hard way. You might have to just participate in a game jam and try to make the next Breath of the Wild and crash and burn horribly. <laughs> but when you learn the hard way, at least you'll learn. So everybody, uh, everybody fails, it's just how you get back up that matters. Everybody stumbles, you just have to get back up. Don't be discouraged. Um, fail fast. Get it out of the way. Uh, some, some other advice is, like, if you're just starting to make games, your first ten games are going to suck. So make them fast and get them out of the way so you can get to game number 11 where you actually know what you're doing. So, uh, state-of-the-art visuals, that's, you know, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Vast open world to explore. Ah, uh, probably not. Uh, unless all your game is, is vast open world, but probably not. Have no shame about downloading assets from the Unity Asset Store or, like, the Unreal Engine Asset Store or just going online to like whatever game engine you're using usually comes with an asset store. Um, an asset is a file that goes in your game, like a texture, a background, a sound file, a 3D model. These are all pieces in your game, those are assets. So don't, don't make it pretty, like make it functional because if you had to choose between a perfect but unfinished game and a finished but not perfect game, the finished game wins every time. So don't get hung up on being a perfectionist or else you'll run out of time. Uh, if, you, if you know how to make a first person shooter, then go ahead and, and show me, but I, I doubt that a first person shooter would be a good idea for a game like basically any of these things. You can make your uh, a first person shooter in four weeks, apparently. Uh, real time strat real time strategy games like if you're just doing two D with like little cartoon characters and it's a top down camera angle, you can do that. But if it's as polished as StarCraft, probably not. 
be it, like just just use your imagination about anything. Just just stay away from online MMOs. Just keep it simple. <laughs> keep it simple. Yes, I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's a little bit ridiculous. But keep it simple is a good thing to remember. Anybody else have any questions about that? Yeah, John Henry. How do you know? Say you're a day in and yeah. you've made your grand scheme, and you're how do you know? Okay. How do you know to scope in? How do you know when to be like, okay, this is not going to work, and how do you address that? If you can't see the finish line in, in your mind's eye, if you know what needs to be done in order to be finished, and you can't see yourself making it in time, scope in. Start dropping stretch goals. Yes? Conversely, is it a good idea then to take in as much as you can and then cut the lead? Or cut the, what's, it, what's the term? Cut the chat? Is that what it's called? Cut the chat. Yeah. No. No? <laughs> I, don't, I don't like that approach. I like the approach um, that comes from Adriel Wallach. She has very good advice. She is famous for doing a game a week for an entire year. Mm -hmm. Like, her entire year, all 365 days of it, was 52 game jams back to back to back to back. She made a game a week reliably. She did it. Like, she set out to do it and she did it for an entire year. So. Girl knows what she's talking about. She has all the advice in the world about prototyping and how to make a game in a week. And you only have two to three days. So her advice about like good games done quick is have one game mechanic. One. And make it nice, make it polished, finish it, make it functional, have it do one game mechanic really well. And what is an example of a game mechanic? Um, you can do more than, like, running. You can have running and jumping. You can have running and jumping and shooting. Like, that's, that's, uh, the, the reason that that's okay is because of the, the engines we use have templates that make it so you don't have to program that from scratch. So, have one, like, one big mechanic. Um, but, but focus on that thing. So, a game mechanic is, uh, like a verb, so jumping, running, and shooting, these are verbs that end in ing, and if you can think of other verbs that you can put in your game, it's probably a mechanic, like climbing, swimming. Most of, that, most of the time, those are just ways of getting around and they're really easy to program, but what is the mechanic that's gonna make your game fun? What's the mechanic that's going to set your game apart from all, the other, all of the other jump and shoot man games? All the other run and swim games, so, Let's, let's just like have a, a, a starting point where you can just download a template and you have a prototype of a game already. Like, how do you make the judges pick yours as a winner? I say one mechanic and do it really well and then like add the art and stuff later. So uh, you, you can come up with almost any example. Like may, maybe you have some sort of game where there's magnets and you have the attraction and the, and the repulse magnets and whatever the goal of your game is, uh, you have to use like the, the magnetic pull, push and pull attraction to win somehow. And there are other other elements in the game, but you like you focus on the magnets. Or some other example, um, uh, you can you can really do anything. Like the sky's the limit. That's why having a theme is nice, is so you don't just succumb to like, oh my gosh, infinite possibilities. I can't think of one. You just hold up one last one. Or the of you have. Yeah. Well they win. Uh, so the, the spooky game jam that was around Halloween, uh, the theme was cyberpunk. And that the, the theme can be anything, by the way. Like, whatever the organizers say goes. <laughs> One of the global game jam themes was a picture of a snake eating its tail, which is called an Ouroboros, by the way. Yes, an Ouroboros. But, but, like, it was a picture of a snake eating its tail, and you get to figure out what that means for yourself. So whatever the theme is, make a mechanic that is fun and works with the theme and like just just focus on one thing don't don't try to do everything Does that answer your question true sure. is my advice it's 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 easier to do one thing and one thing well because then you feel accomplished if you start out with like a whole basket full of ideas and like one by one you have to discard them it, it doesn't feel as fun it, it's a negative feeling in my opinion, I would rather have one big positive feeling than like 
keep having repeated negative feelings slow and dream. like a slow drain. Yeah, I want to have fun when I make a game. Yeah. Okay. What else am I supposed to be talking about? Gray boxing and prototyping. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so. Uh, when I did an interview, actually, with the lovely Heather Decker, um, I interviewed Heather, and she gave me a very fantastic example of what is gray boxing, and it has to do with prototyping a game. And Heather, feel free to chime in if you want to add anything. But the gist of it, you know what? I'm, I'm going to actually pull up another website. So feel free to check out shebuildsgames.com. And... This is where I interview real female game developers and highlight the positives uh, to inspire other people to get involved in building games. And I've got a picture in here of Graybox. So uh, it, hopefully you guys can read this in the back, but it says in tiny text, if I were Grayboxing a platformer idea, I'd be more concerned about the velocity of my jumps the force of gravity, and the distance between platforms than the art, which can be easily swapped out later when I know the interactions feel right. So that is a very good example of prototyping and gray boxing. And when I say gray boxing, it basically just means do the art later after the game mechanics feel good. Allie, did you ask me about gray boxing or did I just think You brought it, it up when I... Okay. Do you remember what you said? Okay. <laughs> or the MMORPG, we were talking about MMOs, and yeah. just like, if you had that budget, it would literally still just be great boxes. Ah, yeah. yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a test, and you passed. <laughs> uh, so Heather is a big fan of great boxing for rapid prototypes, for making broad strokes passes before deeply investing in decisions. Another very good topic on game jams. Like, don't deeply invest in your decision until you know that everyone agrees and like your whole team has voted on it and everybody is willing to see it through to the end. So test your functionality with the simplest placeholder art to gauge scale and the feel of interaction. Plan extra time for testing and revisions. That's more of like if you work at a game studio, plan time for testing and revisions. Uh, at a game jam, you're, like, you're really just hacking things together with duct tape and, and paper clips so to speak. So do that if you have the time. <clears throat> I see some questions. Um, just th uh, this also applies to game jams is like always be constantly aware that you're marching toward, in this case, a deadline. You're constantly marching towards something that is not clearly defined by black and white solutions. And if your role is organizing a game development effort, your title is more equivalent <laughs> to the orchestrator of raw chaos than anything else. Don't let me scare you. It's amazingly entertaining to constantly approach new and fascinating challenges. Uh, thank you, Heather. So yes. I saw some hands. Um, yes, Stephen. I was just gonna ask. I guess like in a game jam, like, how do you assure that that you add things to it? It's working as you expect. The question like, is: When do you like? What's your what's people, what's the what's a good process for going like making sure it's working from time to time? I guess. Uh, in a game jam setting, how do you test the feel of your game to make sure it's functioning properly? That's a really good question, and it's kind of nuanced, especially if you're in a competition environment. It would be uncouth to take someone from another team to test your game, because obviously in, in the spirit of friendly competition, people want to spend time on their own games, not on helping someone else potentially win and potentially get the prize out from under them. So uh, hopefully the, the game jam will provide mentors or coaches or tutors or organizers who are neutral third parties who can help you play test your game. But if you yourself want to know if it feels right, I guess uh, don't let yourself uh, get in danger of just staring at the screen for so long you can't tell up from down. Take a break, get up, walk around, splash your face with some water, get a snack, um, maybe just do a lap, and come back with a fresh pair of eyes, or go away, maybe take take a phone call, do something else for 15 minutes, come back and sit down with a fresh pair of eyes and start playing it again. And if you if you only get like 
less than 30 seconds into it before you're like, oh no, this doesn't feel right, I need to fix that, then that's kind of a way to gauge your game if you don't have anybody else to help you. Um, and that brings up the fact that all too often, people mistake having a two-day deadline for needing to work for 24 hours straight, needing to work for 48 hours straight. Studies have shown that your body does not do well after a certain period of time when your brain starts to burn out. And no matter how long you sit there staring at your screen, trying to wake yourself up, chugging monsters and energy drinks, and I see you just like trying to caffeinate your brain, um, like slapping yourself awake. If, if you are burnt out, then you need to stop until you're not burnt out anymore. Um, if you if you work for eight hours on the first day of a game jam or however long you can, go home, get a good night's sleep, and then come back early and give it 100% the next day, that's probably going to build a better game than staying up all night, as much fun as that may sound, and like doing 50% of what your best work could be. You have a question, Zach? Um, like, um, the CDM has um, couches, and also, um, I mean, Sitting and staring at the computer screen like the computer hacker, like Keanu Reeves' character, the computer hacker, he on the Matrix. You don't, you don't want I to. I do that in classes when I'm trying to write. Yes. So it, everybody's creative process is different. Uh, you just, just make sure you have permission to use couches. Make sure that um, you are staying in the space that has been given to you for the purpose and of stay the in your boundaries, whatever it's called. Exactly. Stay in your boundaries. Uh, observe social etiquette, be polite, don't break rules. Be respectful. Be respectful. Be respectful. Respect. Perfect. And know people's policies and know policies. And well, do it. exactly. That's what I'm saying. I'm just saying, like, like, don't just look at a couch and say, oh, that looks like a great place to sleep. <laughs> make sure you yeah. make sure you have permission to use the couch. Um, if given permission to, yes, you're not in a hotel room. That's right. Exactly. You're not in your own house or apartment. Exactly. Right. So ultimately like you have to make your own decisions um, if your creative process allows you to stay at the screen for 48 hours because you're some kind of super like super creator and you make something that works really well then more power to you and maybe that works for you but if you feel your brain shutting down and you feel like you are not being productive just walk away and okay. uh, yeah, going back to uh team uh teamwork uh what are some best approaches to uh minimize creative conflicts that mm -hmm. can arise especially when you're like tracking under pressure or if somebody wants to pull the idea in a different direction oh. how how do you get over that hurdle? that is another very excellent question and it sounds to me like it's touching on the subject of like interpersonal <laughs> conflict resolution well, there's too many cooks too many cooks in the kitchen that sort of thing let me see what our dear friend Becca Halstead has to say. So let's see. Becca, uh, Team Jam. That should do it. Make the most of your game jam. So uh, at one of the Voxel spooky game jams, oh, hey, get out there. our dear friends won the game jam, and she wrote a Gama Sutra article about how she did it. And the, the headings say, go in with the strategy, and then gracefully allow your plans to fall apart. Don't overwhelm yourself. Work with the tools that you know. Scope is the number one attribute to failure or success. There's always more work to do. Work with friends, work with strangers, laugh in the face of epic failures, have an objective to-do list. So Becca has a lot of really great advice here, um, but I think I think she touches on like that nature of chaos of like you have a team uh, and it, it's not always sunshine and rainbows either. So let's see. Maybe your team changes. Maybe a team member has a totally different idea that everyone else latches onto. Maybe your scope is too big. You have to cut planned features last second. So the advice is, it's good advice. It's healthy advice. Just be organic and flexible. And when change comes your way, bend to it and make the most of it. It's better to be flexible and bend with the changes than to be brittle and break and give everyone else a very negative experience. And this can happen very commonly, uh, is having anxiety because there's a tight deadline, you're in a crowded space, you're in an unfamiliar environment, and you're feeling a lot of pressure. It's very common to get anxious and don't, you, you don't want to have your experience ruined and you no longer have fun because you're having too much 
anxiety at, at a first game jam, which is why she recommends using tools you're familiar with and maybe jamming with people you're familiar with. Um, but uh, she she actually, I think she describes in here that like she, she had to walk away and, and come back. So anxiety is one of the biggest battles to fight in the game jam, especially when things aren't going your way, especially for young developers or folks participating in their first. So I'll, I'll come back to uh, this, this scope bit here, because that's a good place to be. I'm, try, I'm trying to think of a specific example. And um, under no circumstances is disrespecting your teammates OK. When they get stressed, invest time in helping them calm down, unrelentlessly encourage each other, uh, unapologetically spew positivity. When they do well, tell them. When they amaze you, tell them. At the end of the game jam, don't leave the room until you've hugged your team. You know, disclaimer, if, if hugging is your thing. If hugging is not your thing, then respect that too. <laughs> so you ask, like, like, what if some team member wants to go in a different direction? If the rest of the team latches on, um, and you know in your heart of hearts it's a bad idea, and you, you could try to persuade them that you have the experience and you've seen firsthand that that won't work. Try to persuade them, but like it, you, you kind of have to almost do it democratically because if the majority of the people love an idea and only one person doesn't love it, then the social calculus dictates that you should go with the more, more popular idea unless the one is somebody who knows better knows like they've been down that road before and they see where it leads and everybody else is inexperienced and they just don't know any better then do your best to explain to them and if they won't listen to reason then let them fail and just like watch them crash and burn and try again next time uh maybe ask the judge or mentor or organizer if you can change to a different team that might be okay too depending on the rules and depending on how competitive it is does that answer your question oh yeah uh i did want to touch a little bit more on like interpersonal conflict resolution. And I, I welcome anybody to also uh, give any advice, if they have any, on that subject. Uh, but observe the golden rule. It's it's very important to be empathetic. Uh, exactly what, what Zach and I were just talking about, like being respectful and respecting people's boundaries. When you live in the residence hall, they, you have to be respectful when you go to places. So you have to be respectful. In, in a literal sense of like walking around physical space, that's true. Um, but make sure it's not in, in, in their boundaries. Right, and, and the same thing can kind of apply if, if you get into a disagreement with somebody, you don't want it to ruin your whole experience. Uh, does anybody have anything else they would like to say or maybe like share an experience of a time that they encountered an argument or a disagreement, but they overcame it, or maybe you didn't overcome it, and. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna start on this side of the room and I'm gonna work my way over. Okay, so uh, what's your name? <laughs> Sorry? Luke. Luke. Hi Luke. Hello. What's your story? Oh boy, it's terrible. Oh, it does not end well. Alright, I'm gonna uh, time you to two minutes. No, I'll be quick. So basically we just had like a couple ideas. It was early in the brainstorming mm -hmm. stage, and like a uh, cup we had we had a couple of ideas we were throwing around and I had the bright idea like, oh okay, let's all take votes and I like crunched two of the people's game ideas together into one and pitted them against another one. And so I just it was not good. No one no one liked each other. Uh, we all hated each other, so don't do that. <laughs> Does everybody understand the moral of that story? Oh. <laughs> like, wait, I, I need I need nods. I need nods. Guy in the back, you understand? Okay, gals in the middle, you all understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I don't know if I picked up what was wrong there. Okay, um, a question about like picking up the moral of that story. Like, who who thinks that they can summarize why uh, cannibalizing two ideas <laughs> and hitting like hitting one fusion idea against another idea? Like, if you're on a team, why is like doing that, all those things, not the best idea? John, did you want? I think you pretty well. <laughs> Expressed it in your description. Of, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but pretty much, it's like just res like people as individuals will have ideas, and respecting the democratic process is important because the same reason that, like, basically, what I was going to say anyway was that it's more important that you maintain like the mutual respect you have with the other team members because ultimately that's going to be a lot more important than the game that's ultimately not going to be what you want it to be at the end. Like that's it's accepting the compromise you have to make to make the game and to begin with. 
And like at the end of it, you want those people to be your friends because God forbid you want to do something with that game. You don't want those people to be your enemies. Even if you are a totally sociopathic person, you still want those people to be able to collaborate with you in a fair and friendly way so that you guys can maybe, you know, build something together, hopefully. And so just don't burn bridges, pretty much. I was just going to say that. Um, that's a very good point. And unfortunately, uh, that's more real than you might imagine. You might be like, oh, I'm never going to get into so much trouble that I completely lose access to a game. That'll never happen to me. It does. Uh, even student projects. If you lose touch with the other students on your team, like you do a senior project, and you lose access to the, the one guy who had the source code, and but you had a really great game idea, you could be selling it for thousands of dollars. You could be making money right now, and you burned a bridge. That's bad. Okay. Uh, I'm, what is that? I feel, I feel like I want to tweet that, something about like burning bridges in game jam. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> Don't burn bridges, bridges, unless it's your game mechanic. <laughs> Don't cannibalize ideas. I ultimately had a similar experience in my senior capstone where we were having so much creative differences and uh, the best solution was to for me was to just stay in my lane. And, right. Uh, I, I focused on the tasks that had been designated to me and just worked at it, uh, you know, without really giving too much thought. Like I don't know how this is gonna work, but I'm gonna do my part and we'll see how it goes. Okay. Let's let's come back to that uh, after we do Adam. So actually, I'm kind of bouncing off that one. This is a story I was going to tell originally. Anyways. Okay. So when I was in college, I had a game design course. It wasn't a jam. It was an actual course to fill the semester. Um, um, sorry to interrupt, but can you enunciate and project to that camera right over there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was doing a course on game design. Uh, my college didn't have a like, program, proper program. And the uh, it worked out that it was a team of like five people or so, and one person ended up with lead designer like powers, which basically mean that it, like tie break power. Except I was the only other person in the room who cared about mechanics. So it was me versus him, and he had tie break power. Um, and things were going very poorly for a long time until I was able to get the rest of the group actually involved in these discussions. Um, and then we ended up partway through having to restart our game because what we had developed, as I was sitting in my lane working on that, um, what we had developed had, was a dead end, basically. It was very hard to salvage, and we ended up not salvaging it. Um, so that's. I'm not sure if more was there. I, I think a good, a good takeaway is like, uh, don't be afraid to throw something away. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it's, if it's like a good idea for me to use a phrase like, like, be okay with killing your babies. I don't want to go to extremes. <laughs> it's, a it, it's just a phrase. <laughs> like it, like. If you've invested tons of time into something, it's your brainchild, like it's your baby, it can be really hard to sacrifice all the time that you put into that thing. But it, like when you are in a game jam, especially when you're on a team, you kind of have to swallow that and like learn how to fail fast, learn how to give up on something in order to continue to a greater good. So like try to make peace with killing your babies. Sorry for the phrase. Not literally. Not literally. Uh, in, I think you yeah. are closer to this side of the wall. Yeah. So, let's, so I was in his group for last year's game jam. What is your name? Leslie. Here? Leslie. Hi, Leslie. So you were in Luke's group for a game jam or a student project? No, game jam. Game jam. Yeah. yeah. So like, um, so when you make a team, you just like make sure like you um, like you guys have like similar like um, experience in different softwares. Um, because I remember, like the second day of, uh, of the event, um, there, like the program had had like an issue because like some like knew this, this uh, one software, the other knew Unity, and and at first it, it seems like okay for a while, like they're trying to like come out come out with with a, with a mechanic um, for, for, for the team, but it just ended up with with um, two of the three D um, um, programmers leaving. And, um, the, the group, so just like consider that. Yeah. So I'm. What is the takeaway? So like maybe one person was in the Unity lane, and maybe somebody was in a completely different game engine, like Unreal, and they yeah. were like, it, were they like two, two, independently? Was it Unity? 
No, it was. It was like some three D program. It was like two guys wanted to make like a three D game, and then like me and another guy wanted to do a game maker game instead, and we were just split on that, and we were trying to make it both work for some reason, and it just did not work at all. And we just kept trying to do it, and they just left eventually because nothing could happen. Uh, you bring up an excellent point that I would like to make a note on, and that is familiarizing yourself with the tool you plan to use. And sometimes that includes familiarizing yourself with several game engines, even if you don't plan on using it. And I have a hunch, maybe what happened is the fact that Game Maker Studio has its own proprietary coding language called GML, Game Maker Language. And the fact that it's proprietary means it only works in Game Maker Studio, and it makes it extremely difficult to export and share that code. That code literally will not compile outside of Game Maker Studio. It cannot be exported to Unity. It's not the C Sharp language. It's not the JavaScript language. It's not HTML. It is GML, and it will be gibberish to something else trying to compile it. So that is something to be aware of. Is like if your languages can't compile, you're gonna have a bad time. <laughs> um, so that's a, an excellent point of like have a consensus on the environment in which you work. Thank you, Leslie. And that's good. We're gonna do Ali. Just a quick tip. Okay. But I was reminded by one of the capstone stories. Um, so like very much like having your own idea when you go in, like that kind of thing can sort of, it can help and it can hurt. So like what I like to do when I go in is I'm, I am a sound designer. That is it, that is my, my lane. And if other people have ideas, I will do everything in my power to help them. But if they're, if I find, and I like to work with people I don't know, because I think that's fun. Um, but if I find a group that's very unsure about it, like, oh, I'm new to games, then I'll kind of push them in the right direction and then I'll have more ideas. It's really variable based on who I'm working with. So read the crowd when you show up, basically. <laughs> yes, don't marry yourself to an idea and don't throw a tantrum when you don't get your way. Be flexible. Keep All about flexibility. All the flexibility and, and be adaptable, adaptability. Yes, so uh, it, um, nobody's raising their hand, so I'm going to go to you right now. We I, I come think back later. one of my experiences was interesting. Um, it was during one of the global game jams for... What's your name? Oh, uh, my name's Young Hao, sorry. I'm not part of this school. We're, me and my friend Kevin, Can we're you both... say it one more time? Young Hao. Young Hao. Hi, Young Hao. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, we're both from Elmer's College. We do game jams there. Um, I come here to see your event here. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the global game jam event was, like, I think, Waves. The theme, yeah, the theme, theme. waves. 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 Okay. Okay. The waves theme. Yeah. Um, it was interesting because, like, for our group, we had dedicated people. We had one artist, two coders. Um, I think what was it? I think we did have a sound guy, and me is just like able to dab dabble into like any like field to like a bit of programming, a bit of art, a bit Skill of sound. Skill sets. Not excelling all, master of none, but. Oh, you have one guy who is broad in all the areas, sure. but not necessarily deep in one yes. area. Okay, jack of all trades, trades. master of none. Um, we had a, des a design idea for like as a group. I ha I pitched my idea. It wasn't really fully put out there, and they decided to go to a different route. Didn't really mind that. I enjoyed whatever we had to do. Uh, while we were working on it, um, I was dabbling in more in the arts, and then like play testing it sometimes. It was interesting because um, with one of our coders. Um, uh, when they were trying to code something, like, I think it was like a, it was a tower defense game where like like waves would come in, basically little enemies would like so they like, crawl on the beach. Um, thought it was really nice. The thing was that uh, a portion of the code wasn't compiling correctly, so we couldn't progress any further. So one of our teammates started to burn down quickly than everyone else. So they started to burn down, bur burn down or bur like, burn out, burn out, okay, really quickly because they were just getting frustrated. Like uh -huh. it was like. It almost took up the whole game jam, and it was the last few hours mm -hmm. until it fully compiled correctly. So we were sitting; I was sitting there, like t play testing the older revisions, and just like always, constantly contacting him for like, um, like what requirements do you want? Like, do you want it by thirty-two by thirty-two? Do you want it by sixty-four by sixty-four? Pixels. Pixels. Um, do you want it in, in this certain art aspects, or do you want it in this way? Or like, what do you think of this bug? And I, I also was there. Kind of there just to like inspire him, like so, like pat him on the shoulder and like, like give him like feedback to like keep moving. Remind me to tell a story about rubber duck debugging. Yeah, um, it it was nice because like um, in a sense I got closer with him while going throughout the whole process, as well as just um, 
it was it was more like trying to be like I don't know how you say it, like a team team player. Yeah. In the sense that you're trying to like get through this in the in the same time because we all know that like even though the game did end really well, it's still very beautiful, honestly, because we had a lot of good art for it. Yeah. We still enjoyed the fact that like we got to go through the whole game jam and enjoyed that like when we were done, we were proud of like what we did so far in the game jam, I think. So let me see if I can summarize. Uh, that's a really cool story. And, um, you know, wh when we're talking about the team of like people on the game jam, I was talking about job titles. In, in a sense, I was saying like sound designer, or Allie, that's a job title, right? A yeah. sound designer? Um, game developer, that's like something you see on a resume. Uh, like designer, like that's something you put on your LinkedIn profile. Um, and I, I did talk about sort of the conductor of the orchestra who keeps everybody on task, but I didn't, say, I didn't say anything about a cheerleader. And what you just described is being there for moral support. And in the story you were telling, you were there morally supporting him. If you're here for the game jam, come on in. Um, so you, I, I think that what the, the story you just told is a really, really good one. And one that I don't often talk about enough and that I think we don't often hear enough is that if, if you want to be a cheerleader, that can turn things around. That can be the difference between failure and success is having somebody willing to sit there, uh, help you look for errors, help you test things. And even if you don't have one of those like resume job titles, like I described, if, if your name is rolling through the credits at the end of the game, like what would your title be? Um, I don't want to dismiss or, or diminish the, the impact of being a cheerleader. Uh, even if the, the word doesn't sound quite, quite right, Becca's point about like just unrelentlessly and unapologetically spewing positivity, encouraging each other, uh, that can really turn things around. It can turn success into, it can turn failure into success. Um, so I'm really glad that you brought that up. But it sounds like you had a challenge and you overcame it, right? Mm -hmm. Through the power of positivity. And it was just time, that was it. It's every game jam. Right, right. No, but uh, you didn't give up. No. You, you had faith and you didn't give up. And uh, I wanted to remind myself to tell a story about rubber duck debugging. Um, not really a story, but uh, is anybody familiar with rubber duck debugging in the software world? Steven is, Adam is. D did I tell you or did you find out through your own, like computer science classes? Um, I have a rubber duck on my desk. I don't remember where that came from, but I do have. Okay, that's that's exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but do you, Steven, do you know the story of where that name comes from? Um, I don't know the origin necessarily. Of, I know where I found out about it. It's pretty funny. Uh, but, uh, so the... Uh, the, the origin story I know is like Adam, for example, is one of the many computer science software engineer people who just for whatever reason has a rubber ducky on their desk. And the story goes, like you can look it up on Wikipedia later, it's like once upon a time, uh, there was a, in the early days, there was a software engineer who was trying to debug his code and he couldn't find the bug. There was an error, it wouldn't compile, and he couldn't find out why. And he talked to the rubber duck on his desk out loud, and he said, rubber ducky, I can't find the error in my code, so I'm just gonna go through it line by line. Line one is I instantiate my variables, that's just basic boilerplate stuff, like I didn't have a typo there. Line two, um, I'm still instantiating variables, I'm setting up my brackets, do my brackets match in my code. Uh, line three, we're starting, to get into a method of like, when the game boots up, then implement gravity and time and speed and such. And like halfway through the code, like you talk line by line, each line you call out what is going on so you understand what it says. And then as he was like speaking out loud to his rubber duck and like talking himself through it, he discovered that he didn't fully understand one of the methods and the act of speaking it out loud made his brain think about it in a different way that like it activated a different part of his brain than just like using fingers on the keyboard and staring at the screen. He talked himself through it and if he couldn't make sense of it, then he knew there was a problem. And just by coincidence, the rubber ducky is what we call that type of speaking out loud to talk yourself through your problems kind of debugging now. Does that make sense? So if you are sitting down with someone and you're looking at the screen with them and they're talking their way through the code with you, then you are acting as their rubber ducky. 
it's like we also call it pair programming if it's two human beings. Pair programming. Um, like usually one person drives like with hands on the keyboard and another person sits next to them and like watches for typos and make sure that you put the semicolon and the brackets and the parentheses in the right places. And if you want every 10 or 15 or however long minutes or so, you can switch and the other person sits in the driver's seat with the keyboard and the other person starts watching instead of driving. So pair programming is like you're both watching the code to make sure uh, typos and errors don't happen and you both agree that what you're writing makes sense. Basically, the spell checker or rubber ducky and a second person thinking about thinking of the problem with you. So you don't like code yourself into a hole and you can't get out. So that is a very valuable thing to have. Uh, we had some, did I have any other hands, any other stories? Like over here? Okay, Luke, what do you got? I just have a question about version control. What do you think is the best software for that and particularly for you? I love the fact that you need to bring up version control at all because too many people don't know what version control is. And when you're working in a team environment, that's important. If you are a solo, badass game developer who can do it all uh, and you know how to do the art and sound and the code and everything, and you're a one man band, and you don't need version control because you can just save your files on your computer locally. And like maybe you can even save different versions and then go back and if something breaks, you can go back and like, that's kind of version control for one person. But as soon as you start working on a team and you start needing to um, transfer files back and forth to different computers, uh, it, it instantly becomes worth it to have version control. Uh, what, what's the other phrase for it? Like, like, like a repository, what'd you say, John? Well, I was just gonna say a repository. Yeah, so a repository is just a place where you put things Version control is keeping an eye on which version of things you're using. There's another another way to describe it that I'm blanking out on at the moment. Yeah. Well, I mean, like Git, Bitbucket, um, Dropbox, GitHub, like those are all repository-like places. But there's another like actually description phrase that I'm blanking on uh, right now. Re revision control, maybe. Revision and version basically the same thing. Um, I'm trying not to go too in the weeds here. Um, was your question like when should you start using it, or no, like which one like, should? Which you one's use? the best, and then for Unity specifically. It's up to everybody's personal preferences. Uh, when you're using Unity, uh, write this down if you're taking notes. Make sure you close Unity before you upload to any version control at all, because some of the files can lock, and you'll have like one of those weird temp files that gets uploaded to GitHub or whatever you're using. So like close Unity down before you upload your stuff. That's, that's something that's it's like a gotcha that a lot of people run into. And I think that it is up to personal preference. I, I don't want to like tell you what your favorite should be because it's up to you. Uh, but examples are GitHub, which is free unless you need large file storage, which for a Unity file sometimes happens. Um, or, or private repos. There's Bitbucket, which I haven't used since college, and I can't remember why. It might have something to do with there being uh, membership access or pay, a paywall or some kind of subscription. I, I can't remember why, but, but GitHub just became so popular that it just kind of became the default. And there's also something called Perforce, which a lot of major studios use. That's because of, uh, was recommended to me by other students. And I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure Perforce does not have like large file constraints, which is why it's good for large studios to use. Heather's nodding her head. Heather, does do you, do you know of a company that uses Perforce and, and why? Yeah, we use Perforce. Zynga? Yeah, yeah. And there's not file size constraints. Um, it's cross-platform. There are a lot of really good reasons to use it. Um, if you're a student, though, um, I was using Tortoise SVN for a bit, yes. um, even Dropbox, but the thing to be careful of with Unity projects is there is a setting specifically for, for sharing um, because the local files would otherwise conflict. There's, there's a lot of like meta files and things that it makes, right? So you want to make sure that your project has the proper setting to be using, you know, um, version control and whatnot. Yes, that's actually something that's happened to me when I put a game I was working on in GitHub and was looking for help and 
there, like I put it on GitHub so that another person who was not in the same room with me could like take a look at it and help me debug it and stuff. And I accidentally uploaded my local files and my temp files. And what I should have done is like, it's it's safe to go into your file explorer and delete the folder. I think it, it's called local. The the library. There's like a library folder. Your assets folder are where all your important assets are, right? Don't don't touch that. Yeah, don't delete all your assets. That's bad. Um, the library it can rebuild the library basically if 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 you run into a brick wall like that. Yes. It just you. takes a while. Does that make sense? Yeah, does a git ignore fix any of those problems? Uh, there is a standard template git ignore. Um, you just just do a standard internet search for like Unity git ignore, and you'll find a file that's like boilerplate of all the things that get ignored, should ignore, and then it, that means it, it does not upload it to GitHub automatically. So, good call. Um, I wouldn't say it fixes everything. Uh, you still need to make sure you keep an eye on your local and your temp files, but it it um, is good about everything else. Do you have some? I, I would look in the Unity documentation specifically mm -hmm. just to make sure you don't miss step because mm -hmm. some of the some of the files it creates are important too, and you just want to make sure you're set up properly before you, you know, go down the road and Oh, it doesn't work, and it's all you know. So that's it. Okay, Ali, you've had your hand up. Uh, yeah, I would like to just point out like game jams are the time to try shit out. So like, try different ones that you've been hearing about because now is the time to mess it up before you know an actual project. But like the last time I was there, or I was at a game jam, we used Unity's built-in one sure. just because we wanted to try it. They're it actually in, works pretty well. They're built-in what? It has a collab built in with like cloud storage and stuff. So we were using that. Um, but if you don't know where to start, maybe like take a company you kind of want to work for and like see what they use and then try that. Just like try it because that's what it's for, you know? It's free. I don't pay anything for Unity. <laughs> I am a sound designer, not a game developer. <laughs> yeah, so if you go to Unity 3D, there are tutorials, there's documentation. Uh, um, there, the, the collab is probably in here somewhere. If you just look up Unity collab, it should show up, honestly. Yeah. We'll, we can worry about that later. Uh, so, hopefully that answers your question. It's like, if you're making a gigantic game, consider Perforce. It's it's difficult, it's not as easy, uh, but it might be worth it. If you're making a very, very small game, consider something that more people are familiar with, or what have you. So there's no silver bullet, just kind of tailor it to whatever it is you're doing. And watch out for the gotchas in Unity. Okay. Does somebody else have a hand up? So somebody like have a really burning thing that they want me to talk about in the next 30 minutes before we have to wrap. Guy in the corner, what's your name? Sam. Sam, hi Sam. Um, actually, I am the organizer for uh, DePaul's what, Global what's... Game Jam site. How do you pronounce your last name? Ellsburn. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw, thank you for promoting the event. Yeah, no Welcome. problem. Welcome, hello. Um, I guess just in general, um, we've talked a lot about attendees. Yeah. Um, I just general run through of people who are organizing game jams. Like what do's, don'ts, um, what to expect, what to do in case um, everything goes wrong. Um, As an organizer? Yeah. I could spend the next 30 minutes and more talking about that. So I want to open it up to the rest of the room to see if we have any other questions or, or words to the wise or warnings before I go down that rabbit hole. Gotcha. Um, uh, I, I remember a story of somebody who did a, a senior capstone project and, uh, I loved it so much. I said, like, I will pay you 50 bucks if you give me this game. And I, like, I was willing to throw money at this senior project just so that I could have the files on my computer and play it. And unfortunately it, the, the situation was that the student could not get the agreement of the rest of the team to get the files together to give it to me. So like they literally missed out on a financial opportunity. Like I was willing to go as high as 100. That <laughs> <laughs> the game was that good. And like I, I was like throwing money at them and they could not produce. So um, it kind of goes back to maybe not even burning bridges with your teammates, just like 
open communication channels with your teammates, which kind of gets into the territory of version control. What is S Tortoise SVG? What's that stand for? SVN? SVN, yeah, Tortoise SVN. Oh, what is SVN standing for these days? Nah, software something, version something or other, I think. I don't yeah. know, I'd have to wiki Wikipedia that. Now I don't even know. Yeah. But an SVN is another kind of revision control, right? I think that's the one I'm blanking on that I can't remember. So, hmm. Um, is it just a version? Yeah. There's oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ver oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not quite an acronym. It's like an abbreviation, kind of. You might be right. It's yeah. Subversion. That's yeah, a derivative of subversion. Yes, uh, the, the point I was just yeah. trying to make is like, open communication is good. You never know when somebody wants to throw money at your game. And if you can't give them the game, then you just missed out on all that money. So you never know what's going to happen. And keep communication channels open and try to figure out a way. Like maybe you use Slack, or maybe you use GitHub, maybe you use, I don't know, passing a USB stick back and forth to each other. Um, but like find a way to communicate with each other. Uh, I've, done, I've done Slack channels, I've done Google Drive, Google Documents, just like ways in the cloud where you can talk back and forth and pass assets and communicate and get things in writing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, what's your name? Oh, Renee. Uh, excuse me for walking in uh, a little bit later on. Um, I'm going to ask a question because I don't. It probably didn't get addressed. But well, let's find out. I don't know. I'm, uh, what you got? I'm I'm uh, I'm interested in localization, and I started like jumping in and seeing that oh like there's this whole suite of windows programs that everyone's using and i want to see if i can get around that and i'm glad that we're talking about version control here because i think i know enough about that to get in either way in terms of localization a game jam would be an opportunity to at least see the happenings of how uh stories get from one place to another or and if i keep high communication et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. you think that's a good place to start or uh, yeah. if you have any tips for localization, you know, so, and let me know otherwise. I, I think I'm missing a puzzle piece here. When yeah. I hear localization in my mind, I think of translating text from English into other languages around the globe. Yes. And and also like idioms and phrases and expressions that if you literally translate them, they won't make sense. So you localize right. it so it uh, the, the, it's culturally appropriate to the other language. Uh, what I'm confused about is when you said you, ha you see Windows games or Windows apps and you're trying to get around it, and that's where I'm confused. Yeah, I'm so new to it that like the the place I'm starting, I think is is probably coming from a non uh, developer at anything. So I'm seeing mm -hmm. localization tools that are being kind of thrown at me, even though I'm I want to head into games. Uh -huh. uh, I think I might be trying to get through a bunch of junk uh, in terms of what I actually need to do to like uh, uh, you know. Let people know I'm interested in localization, I guess, is what I'm really here today to do. But um, is a game jam a good place to start, possibly? Or does that seem like it's something I would do at the end of such a thing, uh, since it's putting a game together? I'm still trying to put puzzle pieces together. I'm not quite taking right, the journey with you. Fault, when yeah. you say Windows, do you mean like Microsoft Windows operating system, or do you mean like looking through a window, or do you mean a window in time? Oh, Microsoft Windows. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I'm I'm kind of glad. I feel like I'm 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 a non fully functioning web developer, but know enough about uh, technology so I can at least plug into version control. Uh huh. Uh, would this be something a uh, game jam? Be something I could plug into myself? Allie, I think I know how to answer. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, <laughs> I, I'm currently slow so, on the here. With localization, I'm, I'm, that's a little yet. bit. It's generally a little bit out of scope because generally in a game jam, you don't even have to time to do dialogue like i tried to do a dialogue one last time and it, we broke it uh, everything said hey how's it going instead of the dialogue we had generally what you're looking for is like little games to practice on right so yeah. you could talk to the you could go to the game jam help with the game with mm -hmm. the other stuff and then ask to bring it back and say hey can i test this with localization that, that answered my, my question then like, you would have a bunch of small projects to work on like i'd be willing to jump in and, and just pick, and just enjoy exploring what's going on and, and contributing but uh yeah yeah i think you want the final product at the end yeah okay. but that you would you would have to talk to the team members like she said with the whole like throwing money at people and they couldn't get their shit together. Like, um, yeah. you have to make sure that everybody is on the same page, that it's okay for you to use it. Right, and right, right. 
they're okay with it being in the world and whatever like, oh, okay. you're looking for. So, I have a question you. about what your function is as a, somebody who does localization. So are you like multilingual? Are you in a position of, to be somebody who can like accurately trans or translate things? Is that what you want your job to be? What I'm asking yes. is, so you have like a spreadsheet open in front of you, you right. have a line of dialogue and it says like Spanish, French, German, whatever. And uh, are you saying that you're the person who would be able to say, oh, I know how that would be in German. I know what yeah, that would be. Yeah, I think I can explain that kind of quickly. Uh, the, uh, uh, as opposed to just straight up translating, uh, and I, could, I, could, I think I could say technical terms in here, you know, you have uh, ES, Sure. The abbreviation US, used to use ES, MX, kind of and you know, yeah, and they're like the sub languages that have like locales to them. Sure. So localization, I understand, and I'm just jumping into it, it's more based on the client. You may feel like this game was made for them. And so that's what interested me. That's what I'm uh, going no, to, as opposed to just. I think you make a really good point, and I think that maybe we don't appreciate as like all being Anglophiles or whatever. Like we all speak English, so naturally we think, but actually, especially given that it's a global game jam, I think your question is really important. And I think that is, if you are a person who can readily provide that service to people, or you could be a part of a team that you could provide that translating, I know of like apps, or there are plugins for Unity that allow simple ways to use a spreadsheet the way I'm describing. Yeah. So if you have the, uh, ability to actually provide that those translations in a quick in the in a time frame, I think that that's potentially a position you could find on a team. Great. So there's one app. There's one plugin for Unity called Fungus, which okay. is reliant, on, which is very dialogue driven or has a large, uh, and you could look into that, and that could provide you a way to, and it has already the localization built in, and it relies on the, the things you described, ES, etc. And so if you felt like you could do that, you probably could do that in a game jam. And if you're interested in talking after it, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. All right, let me say, um, when you only have two or three days for a game jam, you must add value. And localization, if you are in an English-speaking country it, and the judges speak English, localization is optional. It's a luxury. In such a tight timeline, you have to add value that is essential, not just a luxury. You understand? Yes. However, like, love where your head is at. I think that games should be everywhere and in every language and accessible to everyone. Like, put the barrier of entry so low that anybody can see it. Um, and Global Game Jam is global. It's a very good point. It all depends on who is judging your game and what you do with the game afterward. So, if you have a secondary function, so you can go to the game jam and provide value in the time window and help people and you don't hinder anybody, you don't slow anyone down or like detract time on something that is not essential. Go for it, make friends, be great, learn new things, be awesome, and then have a project that you can tinker with and play with afterward. Great. And ask other people, like get some, get some permission from other people to localize all the games. I know people who just, as a passion project in their own free time, they take big games like Mario games and they localize them just for practice. And they, they probably don't do it with the source code, obviously, but they just practice translating from uh, whatever language it was written in into something else. So like, if you are multilingual and if you just kind of want to sharpen your skills, then you, I don't see why you can't translate anything that you can see. Like, I don't think anyone's going to stop you from reading words uh, that, are, that are publicly available and translating them just for the fun of it. Uh, so feel free to go and, ahead and do that. And, and the, the localization, like I say, is probably a luxury and it's something that you want to do after the game is finished. Because think about it, uh, you only want to translate something after the game is already finished, mm -hmm. right? Uh, during a game jam, everybody is panicking to reach the finish line at the last second. So you almost never have a finished game until literally the last minute. Great. All right. Now, everything you're telling me is that it's uh, very helpful because it tells me like where possibly everyone else's head is at and what train I'm, I'm looking for. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. actually, I, I just came here from I.O. I'm a piano player there, so I might uh, contribute that way, musically. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, there you go. Um, there you go. And, uh, Interesting talking to sound designer. Alia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Your name was Renee. Renee, yeah. Awesome. 
All right. Uh, you are right that nobody had asked that question yet. Okay. <laughs> uh, Heather, did you have your hand up? Oh, yeah. I was just going to add, check out Local Jam and oh. also the IGDA localization SIG. I've seen those, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So those are those are cool things to check out, too. Like nice. Uh, no, I don't think it's lopejam.com. Yeah. Yeah, IGDA Foundation funded a localization jam. Ooh. So then there's a kit there too, I guess. So, um, ah. And then the localization SIG has a bunch of resources. I, I saw that and then at the end it said like, we don't do it anymore or something. Yeah, but... yeah, they haven't done it since, but it's still a cool thing. Okay. And it's still something you could consider doing like, or, or organizing on your own, like, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, okay. Yeah. And there's a kit. Check out the kit. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I like to say I like where everyone's head is at here. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, uh, you know, uh, willing to help. I just walked in. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of the whole point of the IGDA. Okay. <laughs> yes, I, IGDA is the International Video Game Association. Global is global. Yeah, jail. but yeah, I was just up there and I look at the address for the main, for the like where the Mailchimp things come out, and it was like right, right behind. You might be interested. You're on 840 like Blackhawk or something like that. And I was like behind it. I'd be interested in the IGDA localization group. Thank you. Okay. Anyway, that's why I decided to shoot on the down No, you know what? You bring up a point that, like, again, it's not something people generally talk about. It's one of those obscure subjects of how, like, how, I don't know, how wrapped up we all are in our own worlds, in our own cultural bubble. We don't take the time to think about expanding our worldview and at a place like a global game jam or with a community like the International Game Developer Association. It's good to expand your horizons, expand your mind, and, like, Think about maybe translating your game to other languages. Uh, the other thing I actually wanted to touch on is if you are submitting a game to a store um, in exchange for currency, there are rules, depending on the store you submit it to, that can affect localization, or it, it just affects the decisions you make. So um, there, are, there are all kinds of examples, but if I made a video game in my spare time, um, my, my first language is English, and I don't really trust any other languages, my, my knowledge is of any other languages well enough to translate the whole game, for example. So I, if I were submitting my game uh, to, be a con to be a consumer good in exchange for currency to uh, something like an app store, like the, um, the, the, the Windows store for putting it on a Windows 10 computer. Windows phone. Of uh, that too, or the Android app store, or the Apple app store for iPhones. It's Google Play. Google Play Apple. store. Thank you. It's called App Store. Yep. Google Play or the Apple App Store, they all have their own sets of rules, and um, depending on the developer center um, as you're submitting it, there's usually some drop down lists or some check boxes where you decide what countries you want your game to be available in. And for example, I just generally go with English speaking countries for me. So, like, I'll put it. Australia, um, the UK, America, and just other English-speaking countries that I can think of off the top of my head because I figure like those are the people who are going to want to play my game and make sense of it. Um, but um, the, the other things that a lot of people don't think about is like currency, exchange rates, and also cultural rules. Like I know, for example, Germany has its own set of rules that we don't have here in America, and I won't go into too many details, but like there are certain things that you can make games about and mention in America that you cannot say in Germany, like is banned, it is against the rules, it's forbidden. So that also ties into localization. And if you decide you want to monetize your game, you need to think on a more global scale. Okay. Uh, if do you have time after nine o'clock to like sit down and talk about being an organizer? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, we are at eight. 43, so I just want to be conscious of time. Um, does everybody feel like they learned something tonight? Yeah? Has it been worth your time? Are you glad you came out? Yeah! yeah. Okay, good, thank you. I know you guys could be a number of other places right now. It's, it's Friday night, so thank you for spending it here with me. And uh, if there are any other questions, I would like to open up the floor. Um, and if not, I feel like I feel like there's something I'm forgetting to do, and I can't remember what it is. I'm gonna go check my Twitter notes. Email.
Pass, pass around the, the sign-in sheet. Is that the sign-in sheet? That, that is for if you want to get on the... Sorry, it's not a sign-in sheet. Yeah. It's a, like an email. If you want to be on the email list. I'm sorry, I'm not email list. My email. Yeah. If you want to be on the... Are you on the email list already? I'm not sure. Either way, you can throw it on there. For sure. You can throw it on there when it gets done. Yeah. For what? Before for we're all done, though, Sarah, uh, if you had to yeah. impart I'll like the, the top two okay. things yeah, cool. for organizers that that they should be mindful of, what would like even just the top two things be? Top two things for an organizer of a game jam to be mindful of. Oh my goodness! Uh, expect the unexpected. Good. Yes. Have. A team, like have yes. have a support network. Perfect. Like, that, that's two things. Have a team of not just yourself who can support you and be flexible, be adaptable, and expect the unexpected because you would never know what could happen. Perfect. I guess um, specific um, specifics. One thing that I've noticed over the past few years is that. Um, Groups go into these events together um, with the idea of um, with the idea of sort of crushing everyone else, like leaving just leaving everyone else in the dust. Um, when I feel that yes, some game jams are a bit of a competition, but it's also a space to learn. Um, so, as an organizer, what would you suggest I do? Whether try and not necessarily break those teams up, but try to get others um, onto those teams. Oh, that went in a different direction. Uh, the, the, I thought you were going in the direction of like setting expectations of what you can do up front is let everybody know, like this is a competitive game jam, so be prepared to compete, or this is a non-competitive game jam and everybody wins in the end and it's a learning experience. But you say like, do you want to break up the dream team not like like not like there's a group of people it, it's more like and you want to like that's an example of a group another example is that uh programmers tend to group group up together game designers tend to group up together oh and like we don't really get the large dynamic mm -hmm. that i don't know that i would think would be beneficial as a learning experience uh that that could be something that you write in the description uh, as you are organizing the event um, in your description you could have rules that say um, this is a team based game jam and your team needs to have at least one x at least one y and at least one z and you can have multiples of other people but you need to have at least like at least one artist and one programmer and one um whatever the most important thing you think that game jam needs uh and you're gonna have to figure out the nuances of the, the guy who says, but I wanna be by myself and I want to do everything. Right. Do you let them do it? It's up to you. Um, but if, if somebody is like, we are the programmers and we're gonna <laughs> program this thing to victory and we don't need no stinking artists, and we don't need no stinking sound effects and we're gonna win. If you don't want that kind of environment at your game jam, then you're the boss. Like if it's your house, your rules. If you write the rules and they don't follow the rules, you, Kick them out. Especially like if you own the space, like you're you're the president of the DePaul Gaming Club and you are sponsored by a professor and this is a privately owned space and you're in charge and you have the rules right. and you have a support team who's like willing to bounce <clears throat> people out, like those people who don't play by the rules, you don't have to tolerate their nonsense. You can say like, if you guys don't want to play by the rules, then you don't get to play. So you can go make your game somewhere else and then come back to me. Tell me how it goes. It's like you, you, you establish the environment, you set the rules, and definitely want to. Uh, oh gosh, I have so many notes. I, I would need an entirely separate panel to talk about organizing a game jam. Right. <laughs> okay, uh, other hands, other things, people ready to go? What's your name? Um, hi, my name is Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Um, I'm a site organizer for Elmer's College. You're a site organizer? Yes, it's pretty, Elmer's College has a game jam too. Having next week. Um, uh, a global game jam site? Yeah, we have a global game. Cool, awesome. Yay. Um, other people don't have to like wait here for my question, but um, 
I feel like sometimes people come in not knowing many people. Thanks, um, how would you recommend getting people who might not be comfortable meeting new people or like might not know anybody like in the group? Because I feel like you can do an icebreaker, but sometimes icebreakers are awkward and weird. Do you have any like suggestions on making people feel more comfortable interacting with each other? Did everybody hear his question loudly enough? Does anybody else have a story, like, I think a, a true story from the trench would be more effective than me, like, saying, I think, in my opinion, my advice is this. Uh, Allie, what do you got? I like to do this thing where I talk very loudly about how I'm a sound designer and hope someone says, we need a sound designer, because that's worked twice now. <laughs> but, like, that doesn't always work. Um, but having maybe name tags with people's, like, things, like, what they're here to do sometimes helps, just knowing, like, what teams are looking for and what people can bring is really helpful. Okay. So then it's awesome. like, hey, you actually need me, so we should <laughs> hang out. Awesome idea. I love name tags. I love name tags that say uh, the name you go by, the, the skill set you have, and your pronouns, too. I think that it's a good idea to normalize the inclusion of pronouns. Like, I go by she and her. So nobody feels awkward like they have this deep dark secret of oh i don't want to say out loud that i'm actually a designer um yeah. so if it's just on the name tag nobody nobody has to be awkward and i don't know why but there's this like phenomenon in the game dev community of people don't introduce themselves to each other you just like walk up to somebody and, just, and you just talk you don't know their name you just talk <laughs> like i want to know people's names I, I feel like i'm an anomaly in that sense okay is it is it quick yeah it's prevalent that. Uh, okay, one, one other thing that uh, you, uh, you don't necessarily have to try and do this but what uh, one of our capstone classes did to uh, break the ice between members was they kind of gamified their group a little bit by in addition to saying you know their names and what uh, roles they'd like to fill on the game dev team if this were a fantasy questing group what would be your uh, race and class? Your Dungeons and Dragons uh, character. Your Dungeons and Dragons. I've never heard that idea before. And, that, and that, kind of, that kind of gives you a glimpse into each other's like personality types, uh, so to speak. You don't have to go uh, super meta with it, but yeah. it's uh, just a fun way to be like, okay, so this guy's a, a, a half orc barbarian, so he, he likes to be aggressive. I'm I'm a I'm a half lane wizard. I'm gonna sit over here. You know? <laughs> I'm a level 50 halfling wizard, thank you very much. Very good. Uh, hilarious. I'm an elven ranger. I like to watch things from long distances. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't always apply. Are you talking about trying to get people in to attract people to this place, or are you talking about getting people integrated once they're in the place? Um, probably both, I would say. But like mostly when, because yeah, last yeah. year we had people who were not from our college come, and they were like in their own little circle because they didn't know anybody, so I kind of felt bad. And I think maybe having like agents, having people who are there who are aware of the people who are isolated and helping incorporate them. Because like people who have social anxiety who might already be there but have found their little cliques, maybe won't know to incorporate other people. So it's you as the organizer, you can be like, hey, I see this person sitting alone. They maybe don't know how to break that ice. And you can be like, hey, I notice here, do you have a team? Uh, there's somebody over here, they maybe, do you guys want another team member? And a lot of times they'll be like, yeah, and then you'll sit them down and suddenly they'll start talking. So like, don't be afraid to manage those groups. They, they need you for that. I really like that idea also, kind of uh, tying back to having mentors, coaches, tutors, and organizers, keeping an eye on things at a, at a 10,000 foot view, like not participating, but making sure everyone is having a good experience. So, these are all excellent ideas. I'm going to take them home. I'm going to remember these for next time. And if it's okay, I would like to give everybody a chance to get up without being awkward and uh, clap and go to the bathroom or leave if you don't have anything else to say. And I will stick around for people who want to keep having uh, a smaller, more, more focused conversation. So thank you all for your time.